today we've got um, we've got four companies present presenting for us, and, and first up will be uh, Lachlan Muggets and Rob Pickering. Um, that'll be followed by John from Komatsu, Graham from Izuzu, and then Greg from Hastings, and he'll be accompanied with Ashley and possibly Michael. So the agenda is, is about what has changed since last time. So those of you who were in last time, it was around about March, April. Um, so what's changed and the, and the presenters will, will let you know about, you know, lead times, specific lead times and what you can do to help yourself and help them. And what the, um, what's been disrupted in fleet, they are the points. I don't think anybody um, would argue the point with those. That is essentially what's going on and causing a lot of heartache. But now I'll hand you over to Lachlan Margetts from um, John Deere. Thanks, Shane. So my name's Lachlan Margetts. I'm based here in Brisbane. I work for John Deere Australia and then... Um, I'm in my role as the corporate key account manager, so I look after the government side of things. And I have my manager on the line as well, so Rob Pickering. Um, Rob, if you want to say good day. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry. Rob Pickering from John Deere. I uh, look after our turf division, uh, government and corporate customers and work closely with um, Lockheed supporting you guys. So appreciate the opportunity to... Um, go through some of our challenges that you doubt, no doubt are all facing at the end of the line. So thank you. Yes, thanks, Rob. And so obviously uh, you guys would probably deal with our dealers for the most part. I probably haven't met a few of you while I've been out and about, but uh, for the most part, you'll deal with our dealers and, and we work with our dealers to ensure um, the equipment gets there on time and in, in good quality. And, uh, and I guess that's the reason for today, just to give an update on the supply and logistics from a John Deere perspective. And, as you'd all be aware, the last two years have been some of the hardest uh, for managing this and our logistics department's probably worked the hardest of any department here at John Deere for the last couple of years. Um, and we're, we're really thankful for them for doing that. Uh, and hopefully uh, you've been able to see some of those results um, come through uh, in some of the deliveries that uh, you've had. So Shane, if you wanna to go to the next slide, mate, I'll start with a global, global bit of a global summary. So globally, Volumes continue to be up. As you'd be aware, during COVID, there was that everyone had FOMO or fear of missing out and everything from a toaster to um, a car to a drill to a, to a mower, everyone wanted to buy it straight away. And we're still seeing consistently strong global volumes up across everything. And as a result of that, um, with the limited amount of manufacturing done in Australia, all the equipment needs to be imported either row row on a boat roll on roll off which will explain a little bit later or in a container and so this has put a tremendous uh pressure on our supply chain on all supply chains but also john deere supply chain um ensuring that we get boat boat space and uh and, and labor downloaded i guess so more specifically for small plant and equipment so mowers and tractors we as an industry have experienced the highest number of units ever sold on record and continue to see that at the moment actually so the industry is still experiencing record highs uh, across all segments from mowers to tractors um, and, and everything in that agricultural and turf space so we're still experiencing that at the moment and we also have a strong order bank we continue to see strong ordering activity both domestically and globally and i say globally because that does impact um, our ability to, I guess, secure uh, machines from the factory. Our factories are working overtime at the moment, um, quite literally, they're working overtime to produce enough equipment for the global market. It's not just in Australia where we've seen global supply, global demand up, um, but we've seen it obviously globally. So demand's been up everywhere and we have, you know, we're wanting uh, slots on the factory and we're also seeing uh, other, other regions of the world also uh, seeing strong ordering activity as well. So we're experiencing that across, across the line. And so this sort of ties in with West, West. There are still some difficulties in sourcing various components. So you guys would have all heard of the silicon chip shortage. And I, I know it was mentioned there on that first slide, but that's just one, I guess, of the shortages. That was the one highlighted in the media, but everything from uh, little uh, componentry to some engines, 
Uh, there's just sh component shortages across the line. And we're obviously trying to uh, mitigate this as best as possible. And we are continuing to build machinery. And we've actually, in, in some of our larger stuff, has built it to a certain point, parked it up, and then waiting uh, for that uh, component to arrive before fitting it and then shipping it out. So um, components are still adding difficulties to our manufacturing line. And that's not just restricted to John Deere, I'm sure. The guys on the line from Hastings Deering and, and uh, Izuzu will say the same thing, um, that you're still seeing component shortages on various different things, which are, which are holding up um, yeah, various, various little uh, models and, and, and um, across the different lines. So there's no rhyme or reason to models. It all depends on where that component shortage is. So next slide, Shane. So that's from a global side of things. Transport is also a big, probably the big, concern that we deal with here locally in Australia, obviously uh, from a, a supply and demand that obviously resides within our factories, mostly in the US and also in Europe. Um, but we in Australia have a lot of lot to do with our transport and getting the machinery here. Roll on, roll off. So that's your row row, as we like to refer to it as. That's your products like your tractors and your cars. Um, they are continuing to experience uh, high delays at the moment. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. And the first is port congestion. It's taking double the amount of time to clear a vessel through the port just to do with congestion. And that's locally here in Australia. So that's with uh, anything that rolls on, roll off, drive it off the boat. Uh, it's just taking a little bit longer to get through the port here at the moment. Now, if we talk for, uh, in a global sense, ports in Europe, they're actually experiencing, we do, we do source product out of Europe, they're seeing three to four week delays in birth appointments. And that's something which we were chatting to our freight porter this week that they haven't actually seen before. Uh, Europe's been pretty good from a birthing perspective, but they're starting to see some impacts in Europe um, with uh, just getting boat birth spots. So that's adding time, roughly three to four weeks at this stage for a lot of um, goods coming out of, on row row ships coming out of Europe. So that's not gonna matter whether it's John Deere um, or whatever manufacturer uh, equipment you're getting out of Europe, there's some delays coming out up there at the moment. The second reason we're seeing constraints around the transport is labour. Labour availability to unload a row row vessel is at the moment adding a further 12 to 48 hours in each port at the vessel dock. So you add that up by the time they, the boat might dock here in Brisbane and then down in Melbourne. By the time you get to Melbourne, they might have docked somewhere else around the world. It's just all adding up um, and adding a, a, a consistent um, week, couple of weeks to getting row row machinery off the boat and into our dealer's yards and then obviously pre-delivered and then in, into your hands. The last reason um, that row rows have been having a little bit of additional port, a little bit of additional congestion is in an effort, I guess, from John Deere's perspective, we decided in an effort to avert the delays on containers, which I'll touch on in a moment. For some of our equipment, we could actually convert, move across to row row. Um, we usually would bring it in container, but you know, just because containers, we have their own issues there, we, we thought, we thought we'd, uh, we'd bring it across to row row, but that, space is now full and some of those machineries some of that machinery is going have been going back to containers as well but so basically our row row boats are full to the brim there's no more space on any of them at the moment um, and it's all consumed and where that's where we are at the moment so from a product from roll on roll off there are still lots of uh, constraints going on there i did touch on the containers and that is the second point there they continue to be challenging we're monitoring them closely and forecasting further out. We try and forecast, we're actually forecasting further out. We put steps in place to secure containers and vessel space. And I know you'd be aware that containers went from two and a half grand to 15 grand basically overnight. Um, and it's still the case today. That hasn't changed, unfortunately. And so it's still challenging to ship um, containerized goods at the moment. But until that volume eases, so until the volume eases, we will still see strong demand and high prices for containers. So, um, and we haven't, like I said at the beginning, global volumes are still up. So we're still experiencing um, that. And I guess just to that point, um, with us uh, looking further and further out, and I guess putting in different plans and places to try and mitigate these delays, just to that point, John Deere actually, John Deere Limited here in Australia, John Deere in the US, we chartered our own vessel 
from the USA to Australia solely with John Deere product on, um, a combination of parts and complete goods. Uh, we got we got to this point where we had to take this drastic measure. As It's not like we had run out of parts, but we just wanted to ensure that um, you as our customers were best serviced. Um, and so we took the, made the decision to charter a vessel and brought over a, a couple hundred containers or more of product. Um, yes, it was a cost to our business, by sure, for sure. But the upside is now we have supply uh, in the country, uh, greater supply, I should add. So we, we brought in a lot of whole goods and parts. And um, yeah, so we can support any machine down now in, in a much better way, especially from our tractor side, from a harvest side of things, and also from a turf side of things as we come into mowing season. Um, in the yeah, basically now as things start to warm up. So and just on parts, just to finish on parts from a transport side of things, they haven't been exempt from the supply chain. Obviously, if it comes in a container, it's all getting held up. Um, but some awareness for those on the call here, John Deere, once again, we, you know, we, we I guess we try and place you as the customer as number one. And we, over the last two years, 24 months, we've actually chartered a dozen um airline air fl uh, flights from the u.s so a dozen uh, 747 flights from the u.s just purely with john deere parts on there just to meet uh your orders and to ensure that you guys are up and running um 24 7 or when it when you need to be actually so um this was a big cost once again but you know with with that supply that we have now the, the containers that we have in country for parts we're confident we can continue to support your needs moving forward Yes, there's still some delays on whole goods, but from a parts perspective, we have the part here um, to service your needs, especially coming into this uh, mowing season. Um, and the, with, with the amount of water around, um, we should have that. We'll have the blades and belts and everything that you need to ensure that mower and tractor uh, stay up and running. Um, next slide there, Shane, mate. So only a couple more to go. Probably just uh, another thing just to add is just around the regulatory factors. And I did touch on labour there, still challenging, still putting pressure on the on the supply chain. There's no short-term fix for that, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, even forklift drivers are earning quite a fair bit of money at the moment. Um, but we've placed in, in our distribution centre in Melbourne, we've put in the uh, in measures in place to ensure that uh, we work around this and we are very effectively doing that at the moment. Another area which we're about to experience, and I'm sure anyone... Uh, bringing product in from north, north, the Northern Hemisphere actually is going to experience this and that's around the black marmorated stink bug or just to call it the stink bug. It happens every year, happens every year in Australia, but remember port volumes are high, congestion is high and with this, sorry, the brown marmorated stink bug, it requires additional steps and processes that need to take place to fumigate containers and, and boats to ensure that we don't end up with that stink bug in the country. Uh, it's a quarantine, it's a it's a rate federal uh, regulatory factor. Um, there's not much. There's nothing we can do about it, and you know it's in our best interest to uh, comply. So that is taking a bit of time. We are working close with our factories and ports to mitigate those risks. And I can I can say that from a John Deere perspective, we've placed a number of measures in place, and as a result, we've actually started to see that our quarantine holds are down by over half of what the previous year has been. So. Um, from our perspective, things are going well um, in, in regards to those regulatory factors, but just be aware that they are there. It may add a couple of days or a few days at the beginning there. It's not something we can bypass, and I wouldn't want to anyway, just to protect our agricultural industry um, here in Australia. I think there's one more slide there, Shane, and this is really 2023 and beyond. Everything we've spoken to highlights, I guess, the bottlenecks that we have in the supply chain at the moment. and. It's given, I guess, a little bit more detail from a John Deere perspective uh, on where we are, but we have not returned to pre-2020 levels, pre-COVID-19 levels at the moment. We are, we are just not there. Um, industry's high, demand's high, global supply's high. We, we have a little bit to go before um, we return to those levels. And the market is uh, beginning to soften a little bit, um, but in the short term, lead times have not returned. So what does this all mean for you? Um, what's, I guess, the key takeaway from a John Deere perspective, and I know you'll probably hear it from the other presenters uh, over the next half an hour, 45 minutes, and I guess the number one thing I would say to you as a council is to plan, 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 and to order early. Um, 
to plan ahead. Now, this means traditionally, if you would go to market for a tender uh, for a mower now or a tractor now, and you'd want it by the end of the year or, or early next year, I would encourage you to be in contact with your John Deere dealer now, talk with them, plan. And now I understand uh, it's difficult with the budgets in the financial years, but if we want, if you want equipment and, you, and it's gonna be the same for all, all manufacturers, if you want equipment, you're gonna to have to plan early. It is a big change for allocating funds, um, but as we find ourselves in this position, the only way we're gonna end up getting equipment is if we plan early and order early. So I'd encourage you to reach out to your local John Deere uh, dealer. Early, flag the potential for any equipment that you might have coming up in the next, uh, I'd say, well, we were talking about this before, Rob and I, probably nine, nine months, maybe like 12 months in the next next year, explain what you've got coming and we can start allocating and moving product. Even if you don't end up uh, choosing the John Deere product, we can ensure that we've got uh, a machine or some supply coming that would meet those needs uh, should we, um, yeah, should you decide to go with John Deere. And I guess the big question is, when will the supply chain return to normal? I think I've got the answer there for you, Shane, if you click it, click again. And it is, we expect demand's going to soften in the next 12 months to more normal levels, which will ease the demand on the supply chain. And as we see that uh, supply chain demand ease, that's when we'll start to see those lead times come back to what you're probably more used to, I guess you could say, in the previous years before COVID. So um, once again, start the conversation early with your dealership, flag your intentions, and we'll try our best to get it to you as quick as possible. We have a wonderful logistics department who works overtime to try and get that machinery to you as soon as it, as soon as possible. Um, but that pretty much sums us up from a John Deere perspective, Shane. I think I've taken my 15 minutes. Are there any questions? And Rob, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, Lockie, from my perspective, I think you've summarised it really nicely. I think the last slide is really, if there's a takeaway, that's what it is. And But just from a John Deere perspective, Lockie and myself, and, you know, I do this. Thank you for your business. Thank you for your patience. and. Um, of course, you know, we're, we're all here to help. So, um, yeah, thank you and, and good luck with the season ahead. Excellent. Well, thank you, Lachlan and Rob. Um, just um, just so people know that uh, Lachlan and Rob may not be here at the end of the, um, end of the Q&A session because they've got fire drills going on. So... Uh, if we hear a screeching noise, we know they're on the run. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys. And next up, uh, we've got John Tannehill from Komatsu. Over to you, John. Thanks, Shane. Um, and I'll just say, start off by saying what Lachlan said. <laughs> it's as simple as that because uh, my presentation is all, is all we, we weren't collusive, just like tendering. Hey, Lachlan, it was... Um, uh, it was uh, it's almost exactly the same for us, and we can go through... This will take very little time because uh, Lachlan hit it right on the head there. And uh, Shane, if you'd like to click on. So um, obviously we've got a recovery from the post, uh, post pandemic, um, but we've got many interruptions to the supply chain. The, the war in Ukraine has an effect on shipping in Europe and, um, and a massive resignation event is also uh, having impact on, uh, on our factories around the world. Um, obviously the East Coast flooding and some damage to some ports has uh, compounded delays. And um, uh, we're seeing shipping volumes at over 200% of normal levels, which is uh, quite extraordinary and obviously difficult to manage. Thanks, Shane. So we, we rely very heavily on information from organisations like Deloitte. And this is uh, uh, something I found uh, from an article that, and there's the link to the article and it's a very interesting read. Um, when Shane sends out the presentations, um, I urge you to, to have a read of that. But, just a quick snapshot there, you can see that manufacturers supply chains, they all say that, you know, or well, 59% say that shipping delays are their biggest, their biggest issue going forward, um, part shortages, and uh, and then further transportation delays and so on. And, in, and tra a talent shortage is also another impact where, where staff um, are, uh, are showing, um, not showing up, if you like. Thanks, Shane. Um, so for us, in regards to parts, um, the staff and resources shortage. One example we've got with uh, Fleet Guard, massive company, they manufacture uh, filters for us and long for themselves. Um, they had a hot, terrible difficulty recently with uh, the filter mediums and access to that resource. Slowly they're coming back online, um, but it's still having an impact. So uh, 
customers, please be patient with us. Um, uh, the knocks are going along the line. Thanks, Shane. And as far as new machines are concerned, we, we ship from all, all regions around the world. Um, we're having significant issues upstream. Recently, we've had troubles getting engines. Again, Lachlan mentioned this sort of stuff, semiconductors, uh, castings. So one of our machines uh, relies on castings from Ukraine, would you believe? So that's obviously um, not, uh, not going too well. But then what happens is the, the X work states slip, the Q builds, and then there's not enough ships. There's a queue at the dock, and then they're rolled onto following vessels, and it's just this rolling buildup of uh, of delays. Thanks, Shane. So locally, uh, all just about all of our subcontractors and suppliers are at peak demand. Buckets, quick itches, greasing systems, cabin pressurizers, whatever it might be. Um, everybody's under extreme pressure to meet this demand that we've got going on at the moment. Um, Currently, in, in just in Waycol alone, we've got 235 machines in the queue. We may deliver 40, 50, sometimes even 60 machines a month, and then take orders for another 40 or 50 or 60 machines. So that queue of about that 235 units hasn't changed for about 12 months for us. So if you order a machine now, you, end, you join the end of the queue and you work your way through. Um, we're, we're expecting that to continue on for at least another 12 months. Um, and recently we ordered 430 machines um, out, out of Japan factory alone and 85% were already sold before the ship left the port. So, you know, it's a, it's a significant demand and it's very challenging. Do we order another 430 and get caught with, if the market comes off? I don't know, but uh, that's just, just an example of where the demand is for us at the moment. Thanks, Shane. So what we're doing, uh, I mentioned this in the last presentation, uh, My Komatsu is a free online parts portal. If you are, you can track your parts order, you can see what's going on, you can order it without talking to somebody. It's, as I say, it's a free service. It's been proving very, very popular with, uh, with customers because they can do some maintenance planning by seeing where they're, uh, uh, how they can track their orders online. So that's a, a very popular thing. Um, thanks, Shane. Um, I'd just like to quickly touch on some assistance that you could give us as suppliers. Um, uh, Lachlan touched on this as well. Please be ready. Uh, and I don't mean by ready to call for the RFQ, but also to assess it. Um, the, the delays in assessing uh, RFQs and awarding contracts, our quotes are only valid for 30 days. We're in a very dynamic market with exchange rates and pricing. Um, we can only ask that that if you are going to go out for an RFQ and it's got to be open for 21 days, please be ready to assess it and award it. Again, I'm not saying award it to Komatsu. It would be nice if you all did, but um, please just be ready to uh, uh, to assess it and, and award it because um, it, it does it does change moment by moment. And of course, uh, consult with your Komatsu representatives about stock availability and delivery lead times. Currently, at the moment, um, I can't sort of say there's a there's a generic lead time because it's different for different products. Um, larger excavators, um, sort of not too bad. Wheel loaders, you wouldn't see one from us until probably March next year if you ordered today. Thanks, Shane. Bit of brand um, awareness for you all. You can leave that slide on for a second, Shane. I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. No worries. Thanks very much, John. Appreciate that. And yeah, you know, I guess we're just um, John's reiterating what uh, Lachlan and Rob said about um, you know shortages in the supply chain um, and logistics network. And um, yeah, when you're ready, get your orders um, and the RFQs out and about. Make the decisions as um, quickly as possible um, for everybody. Um, next up, we will have. Young Graham from Isuzu Trucks. Over to you, Graham. Thanks, Shane. Excuse me. We'll flick to the next slide. So yeah, I'll echo the sentiments of the previous guys. Exactly similar issues, but we've got some uh, better news than we had um, last time. My colleague Stephen presented this. So I'll run through the initial supply impacts, current supply. I'll scoot over them because you've already heard a bit about the challenges we're experiencing are the same as the other guys have as well. Um, talk about those lead times and then obviously things we're doing to try and reduce those lead times. 
and again, the actions we'd, that we'd ask you guys to take into account as well. Thank you. So I guess impacts on supply. So the market forecasting and ordering on Japan. So IML is our parent company, Isuzu Motors Limited in Japan. So all of our vehicles come from Japan. Um, but our ordering has gone absolutely astronomical over the last couple of months. You can see that bottom point there, the truck industries, the volume is up 13% year to date. Last year was a record market as well. So it's yeah, up 13% off the already um, bigger record. I saw one of the, I saw a comment in the chat from, I think it was Michael Borg, that was driving the demand. Um, Number of things. So the instant asset write-off was a big one, more so from the be a private, like a trade type tradey type customers. We're seeing a large number of um, people now moving from Utes into into light trucks from a legality payload towing capacity perspective, as well. And I mentioned before the record uh, record order rights month on month. So yeah, I'll get you to skip to the next one, please. So this sort of shows the truck market. So this is year to date, the end of September. So last year the market was. Nationally, total truck market was about 25,000 units. So far, the end of September, we're almost 28,000. So that's an additional 3,000 trucks delivered into the Australian market um, from the same time last year. And there's no signs of that slowing down between now and the end of the year either. So just to sort of paint the picture of where the, where the growth is coming from. Thanks, Shane. So some of the supply issues, these aren't, this list is certainly not extensive, but it lists some of the ones. Um, Allison Transmission. So Meritor Axel. So a lot of these components come out of the US. Um, we source from the US directly to Japan, then put them in our trucks and send to Australia. The US with global export markets, they like to keep some things for themselves and then export, supply the rest of the world. We have had some wiring harness issues. I'm pleased to say the majority of these have certainly improved significantly. Um, there are some still some driveline componentry issues, particularly on the four by four product. Um, so the lead times on their four by fours are certainly longer but everything else I'm pleased to say is coming, is coming back in, which has been a good thing. Um, through COVID, one of our port of entry agents initially uh, went into administration at the start. So that was obviously a challenge there. We've diversified, we now have two port of entry agents. So Auto Care look after our F-Series, so our medium duty products, and Auto Nexus looking after our N-Series, our light duty products. Um, they're fully up to speed now, completely integrated with their business and the volumes that are coming out from the ports are improve significantly. There are still some delays at the wharf on F series, um, but I'm pleased to say that backlog is they've put, certainly employed more resources at the port to be able to get those vehicles processed now to the dealers and the bodybuilders. But certainly from an N series perspective, that has improved. The throughput's improved significantly in the last few months there. Thanks, Shane. So essentially pre-COVID, a factory order would, would have been three months, uh, five months for a factory tipper because the tipper bodies are fitted in Japan. Uh, at the moment, I'd say minimum of six months as a as a general rule. Uh, some of the 4x4 products, as I mentioned, could be longer. We could see touching nine to 12 months on some of the 4x4 products and certainly on factory tipper, just from a sheer body build perspective there. Uh, but general, just a general rule, about six months for a cab chassis from the time of order to delivery, um, certainly not unrealistic. Um, put stock on grass in here. So traditionally, Isuzu have always held an assortment of models in gra on grass around Australia for our dealers and customers to access within a week or so of placing an order. Um, I'm pleased to say that we're starting to see some of that happening in some of their key models, some of our, re our ready to work models, so such as the, the tray pack, which is on the screen there. So there are, in some models, we, we are starting to see some free stock around the country. It is limited and it, 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 will, it will go as, as quick as it comes out sort of thing. We provide our dealers an update each, each Monday of the stock that's available around the country and the model lines and what's in the pipeline coming through. So certainly keep talking to your local dealers about availability, but it is absolutely our intention to continue to carry stock on grass at the end. The factory order model and having everything solely to be factory order is not how we want to go to market. We've never done business that way and we want to keep having vehicles on grass because we know that there's urgent needs for customers and we can try and sort that out. The other challenge is bodybuilders at the moment. And this is where we're seeing probably, I guess, the biggest challenge in the market. So obviously at the start of the pandemic, the supp with supply out of Japan for us was the issue. Um, Japan, we've managed to secure a significant additional volumes from Japan, which has been great. Everyone, the other guys have mentioned shipping. So then we can get, get the trucks built. Shipping was the issue. We then had the issues at the ports. We do still have some, but they're largely resolving themselves now. It's the the bodies seem to be where the, where the layers are coming in now. It's almost like we've moved the bottleneck just down the pipeline a bit further 
Um, so I know, so please yeah, talk to your local, talk to your dealers, talk to your local suppliers about what the what their lead times are on bodies because it can vary greatly. I've had so heard some saying four weeks. I've had some, I had I was having a meeting with another customer yesterday and their body builder said 2027. 20, it's a very specific bit of kit, but there's no rhyme or reason in terms of the lead time. So I've been just stressed enough. Please continue to talk to your bodybuilders there. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we've managed to increase um, increase our production out of the factory in Japan. Our new manager, we've got a new managing director who's very connected at the higher levels in Japan, and certainly he's been able to secure secure additional volume. And also with our port of entry agents, we've yeah, been able to incre secure increased production and processing capabilities there. And the big thing is we're working with our dealers on a certainly on a monthly basis, and it comes back to almost a weekly basis to prioritise the sold vehicles. So if a vehicle is sold and flagged as sold in the system. That will go ahead of a vehicle that might have been ordered for by a dealer for stock. We can try and keep obviously get the customers customers vehicles through in a timely fashion. And also, if there's certain body um, body constraints we need to meet, we'll do it doing our best to meet those. So let's say the vehicle might be sold, but it might not need to go to the body builder for three months. Whereas we've got one that's due in tomorrow, we'll try and prioritise the one from tomorrow. So, so again, regular communication with the dealers will help help those priorities come through. Thank you. And again. Again, this echoes what the what the rest of the team said. Um, so not only the replacement, um, your standard replacement vehicles, just forecasting is important, but also any incremental or any new um, new vehicles that may come up. Obviously, certainly there could be urgent, unbudgeted vehicles that are required. But yeah, the longer lead time we can get on the majority and all our suppliers are the same, because the reality is whichever cab chassis is going to is the cab chassis that's chosen, chances are the body build is going to be the same. So yeah, any the number of the lead times we can provide there any, is great help. Um, yeah, tender requests again based on the lead times. As I mentioned, minimum six months. Uh, I'd be working on and potentially longer to allow for some of the body build time, and depending on the specific models. And yeah, purchase orders again once it's once the RFU's been assessed. Yeah, please don't delay in issuing issuing orders. And as I said, there's weekly updates available around the timeframes. And it's, uh, talk to your local dealers. We're providing far more information than we've ever provided to dealers in terms of the supply chain, the strength that they should be able to provide you and update it at any given point in the, in the process. And I guess that's, I think that was it from my side. Thank you, Graham, for Thank that. Um, and yeah, I guess we got the similar message. What, uh, unfortunately, I had a, um, a couple of bodybuilders in different areas lined up to present today. They've had to pull out. However, um, you know, similar message is coming from them with regards to, you know, there's a lot of raw materials that are coming in from overseas, which we probably don't realise. Um, you know, obvious things are, you know, cranes and hook lifts that are coming out of um, the Northern Hemisphere. There's delays on those, cost increases um, quite steep. Um, our our good friends in Ukraine are obviously experiencing difficulty in getting, um, you know, steel out of there, nickel, and um, on uh, for the European market, obviously there's a lot more, you know, electronics and wiring harnesses going into European products. But um, it's definitely the same issue um, around that shipping and logistics that's causing problems. And, yeah, the Ukraine war is not helping matters at all. So next up, we've got uh, Greg from Hastings. And Greg, I'm not sure whether you've got um, um, Ashley and Michael there, but I'll hand it over to yourself. Okay, thanks, Shane. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure Ashley and Michael are on the line there somewhere. Um, I guess same, same again, guys, as, as to what uh, the other suppliers have said, we are in, the, in a similar boat. So um, first of all, yeah, I'm not, to introduce myself, I look after the government business at Hastings and also a product manager for the earth moving uh, line of products from Caterpillar for Hastings for Queensland and um, Northern Territory. Um, for like uh, Ashley, if you're there, if you'd like to uh, jump in and then you can start your side of things in the introduction. Yeah, no, no problems. Um, just jump to the, the next slide, thank you. So yeah, I'm just um, obviously there. I'm responsible for uh, all the transport uh, activities for AP, so anything from Australia, China, Japan, Singapore, 
and then also for Australia, all the machines inbound, uh, wherever they're coming from uh, into this region. Uh, my team looks after all that activity. So what I thought I'd give give you, and it might be repeating on some of the words, is um, I'll just give you a, an update on the market uh, as far as air freight and as far as ocean freight. Um, and you're probably going to see similar themes to what uh, you've seen throughout the other presentations. So if you can just jump to slide four. So yeah, sorry, uh, a, lot of, a lot of writing in there, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through the details. But, but in short, what we're starting to see with the, the air freight market is a little bit of softening um, uh, with utilization still at highs. It's around 110%. Um, but obviously with everyone starting to uh, travel again, you're starting to see the likes of all other airlines starting to come back into the market. Uh, for instance, Qatar Airways uh, is getting stronger into Australia. Um, the likes of um, Cathay Pacific are starting back into Australia where they've been gone for about a year. Um, so that will add some further capacity into the market for, for any air freight. From, from a Caterpillar perspective, we've been air freighting uh, for the last two years consistently um, during that time. We've probably had a charter once a month uh, that comes into Australia that brings in uh, service parts, um, not, not for machines, but only for service parts. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is obviously the cost on that. As uh, exchange rate goes the wrong way, the fuel's going the other way. So we're not really seeing any relief on the, on the pricing because uh, there's all these different factors. It's either the fuel goes up or exchange rate goes down. Um, so you end up paying more. Um, so at this stage, they're expecting maybe mid next year before they'll start seeing prices on the air market uh, actually moving. So if you have a look there on the right, you can see that pretty much every sector has a has a challenge. Even the old Trans Tasman trade, you think you'd get an air freight across to New Zealand overnight? That could take anywhere to four days to get a piece of air freight just to New Zealand at this stage. If uh, we jump to slide five, so slide slide five probably tells a tale on the on the the ocean side is that um, about six months ago you were probably talking around 100 to 50, 150 to 160 percent utilization on the ocean market, meaning that uh, for every booking they had 160 160 bookings for every hundred that they could take. Um, so you're starting to see that reduce. Um, especially into this region of the world, it's around 90 to 110% at the moment where you are getting the bookings, but the delays are still occurring as far as waiting at ports or there's other issues that uh, jump into it. But most of the challenges for Australia is that we're an importing nation, but we've got nothing going back out. Um, so some shipping lines are are dropping calls into Australia for that reason, because they're saying, well, what's the point of going to Australia when I've got nothing going out? Uh, if we look at the row row carriers, for instance, there there was two major carriers, uh, WWL and uh, Hoag's. Hoag's are pulling most of their services out of Australia on the row row space because of there's just no volume going back out. Um, so that's something that we've got to keep looking at over, over the course of the next 18, 12 months. But you can see there just from the US, um, the rates are remaining high, but um, there was one uh, uh, article probably about nine months ago, I was actually speaking to Hastings Deering and uh, at one stage, the amount of containers waiting in Long Beach was the equivalent to what the port of Brisbane does in a year. Um, so that just can tell you what's happening in the supply chain world when that amount of containers are stuck in Long Beach. So that obviously had a long-term effect on the US in catching up and they are slowly catching up uh, across, the, across the globe, the US. If you jump to the next one. So I think this was mentioned before, obviously our, our good friends, the stink bugs are back. Um, so really that starts now. Um, so all the machines, Usually you don't see too many issues on machines because they're coming on the row row and they get fogged and they get clean prior to leaving country. But there has been a few shipments that come through, unfortunately, be it used equipment from someone else 
or some other OEMs that um, obviously then contaminate the whole vessel and it's got to get fogged outside and that usually can delay it 48 to 72 hours. But that capacity is still over capacity. Um, we don't expect that to improve until at least this time next year. Um, but uh, similar to um, uh, one of the other OEMs, we have converted a lot of um, container freight into the RORO services as well um, for our smaller machines. So the next slide, probably just to, just to give you an idea, you can we're starting to see rates drop. So this is just an index, uh, Shanghai Container Index, where you can see at uh, the start of 2022, you're, you're talking around four and a half thousand US dollars for a TEU. That's slowly starting getting down to about 3,000 US dollars a TEU as of this time right now. So the market is definitely starting to soften. Um, it's still nowhere near the levels it was where the rates were around 1,500 to $2,000, but there's signs that it's starting to, um, to ease up. And then just on, on the last slide, what are, what's, uh, what's some of the other challenges? I think we, we've seen, we've mentioned this before, some of the natural disasters uh, for 2021, 2022. I think uh, even going across to Western Australia, I think we've had floods, we've had fire, um, we've had everything uh, in the last two years. Um, obviously the floods in Brisbane had a major impact on the supply chain, a lot of containers uh, for instance, were routed down to Sydney or Melbourne or Adelaide, uh, and they pretty much shut the port of Brisbane off. Uh, from a machine perspective, we uh, moved a lot of them into Port Kembla. So we do have a lot of flexibility when those things happen. One of the things that we've got on our radar, but is what's the longer term plan for, for the transport industry? A lot of drivers are old and there's not a lot of new drivers coming into the market uh, for driving trucks. Uh, interstate uh, trucks is an issue. Um, so that's something that we're monitoring. And obviously the cost drivers for um, moving domestically are moving significantly. Um, domestic air capacity um, for any like emergency orders, there's really only two providers in Australia. Um, so it's either use one or use the other, um, but we're still working through that. Um, and some of our logistics challenges still, we put down there some government bureaucracy. So that's, they change a lot of the process as far as how you import and how, how you export. They're not consistent. One month it's, hey, you can do it this way. Next month it's a different way. So we're working through some, some avenues there. And obviously our lead times machine and parts uh, are still high. Um, Two years ago, a container from the US would take 42 days. Um, at the moment, it's taking 59 days for us to get a container from, from the US. Um, that was at its peak of 73 days. So it's uh, slowly coming down. Um, and yeah, just all those other issues, that we, which are day-to-day -day issues that uh, my team uh, deal with. But um, in general, we're starting to see improvements in the supply chain. Thank you, Ashley, and Michael, and Greg. Uh, if you've got any, Greg, do you have something else to add, or do you want to leave it to the end? No, that's right, Shane. I'd like to just add um, on to uh, what Ashley said, and also a few of the other guys um, from a local perspective. So, like Ashley spoke on behalf of Caterpillar, from a Hastings perspective, where um, whilst we get all the information and data from Cat. We then we've placed a huge focus now on demand planning for uh, try to then signal our workshops, our suppliers from a local perspective, on what we've got coming, uh, so we can try and gear up our labour and that which is is I'm sure everyone on on this uh, webinar will probably appreciate yeah you know, labour shortages across all sectors so yeah you know, that's that's a challenge for everyone so. Yeah, you know, we can have all the machines turning up and we like uh, Graham and I, Susie said, we're starting to see some some models on the grass again. But then, as John said from Komatsu, we've got a large order uh, of list of machines which are, are waiting to go through the assembly process. So, you know, it's one thing getting the machines here, but then we've got to get them through the shops and then and out to out to deliver to customers. So, um, yeah, the challenges are right to the end until we uh, you know, you cash for keys and, and the, the machine's working. So. Um, we'd rest assured uh, to all the people on the on the line that we are doing 
a lot behind the scenes to try and shorten those time frames. But uh, yeah, there's lots of challenges along the way. So uh, yeah, any questions and answers, questions there, um, yeah, please feel free. And Michael, if you've got anything to add, if you like at all. No, it seems like Michael's silent, but that's okay. Um, so we, I see that we've got one one question that's been um, typed up there, and I'll just have a look and see. Uh, there we go, Michael Borg. Um, what is driving all this demand? I mean, it's, I guess you've seen that as a manufacturer. Um, what for any anybody? What do you, what's what are you seeing that's driving the additional oh. demand? I'm happy to take this one, Shane. So, yeah, certainly from our side, the instant asset write-off made a massive difference. No, no question at all about that. Um, there's still some discussion around when that's going to end. Whether will it be a hard finish on the 30th of June, or will there be a soft landing? So, orders placed by 30 June, but then delivery um, delivery can still happen after that. So, that's still to be determined. But the other part of it too, I think, from a that's sort of in the re our retail sort of business, like your yeah, farmers, tradies those sort of people, but from a corporate and government perspective, I suppose, and some of the customers I've spoken with, with the reluctance to do anything during COVID with the uncertainty initially, I think a lot of companies have also got to, um, there was no re replacements were pushed out as a result of that, but also, I mean, I think anyone you speak to at the moment, regardless of the industry, their businesses are absolutely booming and you guys would be no different at all. So I think there's just that much more more work to do that there's, it's the incremental increases that are also driving the demand based on having more more business to do and not just the replacement sort of thing. So I think there's a bit of a combination of the two. So certainly we're expecting to, to quieten off a bit after that incident asset right off finishes, but then you look at the, look at our week on week order intake and everything else, and there's certainly no signs of it, of it slowing down anytime soon. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Graham. Have we got any other questions that um, people would like to ask? Well, it looks like a little bit of silence from there. So that either means uh, people don't know how to ask a question in the system here, or um, you've given them a lot of information to process. And, um, and I'm, I will thank all the presenters today for for doing this, taking some time out and giving the information to, to local government, um, fleet and procurement. It's one of the things that we, um, we're we trying to do um, from a local bike perspective is give that information and get it out there. Firstly, you know what you need to, um, to do time-wise um, in getting your orders together and maybe, um, you know, uh, not so much lower your expectations, but make sure that um, you don't pick up the phone and ask for um, you know, a piece of machinery or a truck and expect it delivered next week, uh, especially when, uh, when we get to that pointy end of the, the financial year around that um, April, May, June, when um, everybody's trying to get it, spend all the money that's left and, um, but get everything delivered on time. We have got another um, question here from John Keane. So, um, so that's more of a comment. Uh, local government is, as an industry is suffering the same challenges with labour and, and supply sh uh, shortages. It may be a bit slow to get back to full fleet procurement activities. And that's probably, probably right. I would think that, um, you know, the funds that are in local government at the moment, um, where that's probably a little bit tighter than uh, it has been. And maybe some of that money is being put into projects rather than into replacement of um, assets. So if there's no other questions, um, I'd just like to I'll wrap this up a little bit. Um, just so um, everybody can go about their day. Um, just to let you know that we have a, a final webinar for the year, um, which will be a, a slightly different audience and certainly different presenters, but we're, we're looking at uh, a green energy, zero emissions and EV infrastructure 
arrangement for 2023. So we'll have a, a variety of different presenters. Um, a number of those won't actually be existing suppliers. So this is a bit of a um, an opportunity for people to ask some questions um, and make some suggestions about what they would like to see in an arrangement. But um, wrapping that up, local buy would like to thank um, you know, Lachlan and Rob from John Deere, John from um, Komatsu, um, Graham from Izuzu, Greg from Hastings, and Ashley and Michael from Caterpillar for your time today.